So this is old and new uh, work. The Jogja field work is old and new in time. And uh, the other field work, uh, as some of you know, since coming to Singapore, I've been playing music uh, here with a couple of local musicians. Um, and uh, part of that is in this paper today as well. So that's new field work for me. To working on this new idea that I call deep sound. So it's obvious that I take it from deep play. Okay. My interest in, in sound here in deep sound is to see the ways that sound evokes participation and exchange in the milieu. Okay, So I draw from Foucault's work, if you just take this statement on its own, a certain number of combined overall effects bearing on all who live in it, the milieu, then it does sound like the environment. Okay, But he was interested in how these effects, again, evoked attention, exchange, relationships, and he talks about devices of saturation that intensify local experiences. And of course, he was always interested in the body, right? And so um, there is a sense of that these devices of saturation are some forms of embodied history are evoked embodiment within the context of social relationships. So deep sound for me is a device of saturation. It's a point of intensification and in local experience. So two examples today to kind of lay out this groundwork and see if any of this works. Kronjong music in a Javanese neighborhood, blues and beat music in Singapore guitar shop. Okay. Now this is the band that played for about a month across the street from where Jan and I lived in this neighborhood for about a little less than two years, 14 months or so. And this band appeared on the front porch of this of a man's house um, who had just moved into the neighborhood like Jan and I almost about the same time, he with his family as well. And these guys played every night for about a month and then it stopped. Why did these guys choose Cronjone? Why Cronjone? Okay, if it has a personality, if it has an identity, why why did they choose this one to play? Is it just because the guitar? Because it's easy to get the guitar? Is that why? All right. Well, certainly they chose this music because they could play. The, the instruments were easily portable. They could be brought from one neighborhood to the other, set up. Okay, that's one reason why they chose it. They chose it because this man. Sponsored it, Pat Wyon, okay. the guy who lived across the street from me. He, had, he and his family moved in with Jan and I. They were strangers to the neighborhood, just like we were. People were just as apprehensive of him moving in as they were of Jan and I, just in different ways. Pencil thin mustache, and he was a man of modernity in the neighborhood. Okay, He was clearly involved in the kind of circulation of consumption that many of the men in the neighborhood did not have access to for a variety of different... If I would have just looked at Chrome Jones, when these guys asked me to write this paper, if I would have just stayed at the representation level, okay... I would have, from those three examples that I showed you, I could have talked about, oh, Chrome Jong has this sense of uh, uh, emotion and, you know, human irony of love. It's, you know, both hurts and it's beautiful. You know, that love is like a rose. It smells great, but it pricks you, you know, at the same time. It's full of longing and lament. Has this uh, the voices quaver? The music is can be very sad. It draws people to tears. 
It also represents a cosmopolitan urban history. It often uses pastoral images, especially in the, the, the karaoke versions of it, um, but also in the lyrics. The, one of the most famous songs, Bengawan Solo, is all about the, the countryside and the river that takes the, the people from Solo down the river out to the trading ships and away into some other trade, into the trade world. It's an interesting song, actually. Um, it's the music associated with Indonesian, with the rise of the Indonesian nation state. It is the music that there were discussions about which music to use to represent the Indonesian state. Gamelan was in the mix, but it was too Javanese. Okay, Kronjong, because of its otherness, because of its lack of ethnic identity, its association with urban history and, and uh, um, it became the music of choice, and it still remains, all right? But it also has, as you saw with the song for Anna, um, something going on in terms of gender. <laughs> players in Indonesia were men, okay, and often seen to be as kind of wild, on the loose, unstable, unsettled, someone to watch out for. Hide all the women, okay. The employment rates and underemployment rates among men were much greater than among women. Women had an easier time to get a chance. But here's the un open unemployment thing. Now, open unemployment's an interesting idea. It is, if you have a higher rate, that sounds like it would be a bad thing, right? Open unemployment. But what it means is that you expect to get a job. You're actually thinking about looking for a job. So this was kind of this, this you know, sociology, at least around work and, and labor, that was playing out in the neighborhood. Women at least believed our perhaps if this if I can translate this data to my notes in my journal, that they actually might get jobs where the guys didn't even think they would get jobs. And anyway, they had these outrageous expectations about the kind of jobs they would actually do. They weren't going to do construction. They weren't going to be a janitor. Women had become increasingly the focus of Indonesian development efforts through women's organization called Pay Ka Ka. All right. Women became much more involved in the public spaces of the neighborhood doing development work, cleaning up the place, making sure older people got to hospitals, making sure kids were weighed and uh, their nutritional status check, checking the blood pressures and the blood glucose levels of, was the space in the neighborhood was changing for men. What had once been public space where men and as they would stand up in front of microphones at the circumcisions and the weddings and give the formal prayers, that that power had become, was still there, but it had become hollow, or at least disenfranchised to some extent, at least as life was changing, and that women were becoming much more important in the public spaces of the neighborhood, uh, and that these men felt this, okay? Distribution of resources, power, prestige had changed because of the need for development and the focus on women's activities and women's labor to enact development, um, and that the space had become feminized as a domestic community. This is literally yanked out of Jan's book. Okay? And that this Kronjong music, this cultural production, took place within what I, with this real politique of community life. All right, the milieu. And to see that perhaps making Kronjong was um, a way to kind of capture, absorb, work with, respond to these changing sets of social relationships in a place like this urban neighborhood uh, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a very local way.
Okay, beyond not using the laws of the court or the police or the, the, the institutions of the government, but the local institutions available in the neighborhood, what um, Nancy calls a simple jurisdiction. The music in Kronjong, like the rough music, was in some way a mode of life in which some part of the law still belongs to the community and is theirs to enforce. I realized I was learning through Keon some very kind of different angles on Singapore society then and perhaps now. And so this is kind of what's emerging out of this and this is what I want to end on today. One, again, my idea about attention. So what drew these guys to Western pop music to play Western pop music at this time? Okay, They tell me Cliff Richard in the Shadows, the genre was called pop yeah yeah, you know, from the Beatles. She loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's from. Yeah. Um, when I talk to these guys, they tell me that they learned uh, about the music in their families. Keon got his, his uh, first guitar from his sister's boyfriend. It also is an insight into a Singapore that was, as always been, what was intensely cosmopolitan at the time, both regionally and globally. Uh, lots of things happening regionally in terms of exchanges and circulations and, and attention to music. Keon was Chi Singaporean Chinese raised in an English-speaking household. Okay? This constant tension in the talk with these guys about whether you're going to play covers and originals, this idea about creativity that is so important today um, in Singapore talked about in the past as well. They had trouble playing their music. They could not get gigs. There were several reasons why. But at the same time was uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's and the PAP's intense anti uh, yellow culture campaign. Okay. The idea was that if you were associated with Western pop music, it wasn't so much that, you know, the West bad influences, it was the effect it was going to have on your personality and your character, that you would become lazy. Not because of the, well, partly because of the drugs and, you know, wearing long hair, but you wouldn't be, you know, disciplined and productive. So, out of this, uh, comes potential topics for, you know, the, uh, that I'm collecting data on at the moment. What is sound control, noise pollution it's called here, have to do with musical opportunities? Can we talk about creativity, place, and community? It's very hard to find a place to play music in this town. Real estate prices are totally out the roof, so you can't just start a bar and a little pub and make it on a dime. There are no neighborhoods like that, you know? So it's really tough for bands to find places to play and for bar owners to take in bands to take a chance on, especially doing originals. You can't have bars in housing estates. Mm. Yeah, so right. all housing estates are out. So this has a relation. This is uh, related to some degrees and what people do and how uh, what and and the kind of controls on creativity. Okay? Mm -hmm. This has been probably the most fruitful area of my work so far. I'm hanging out with men again. So the wild masculinity associated with the Crone Jong. Here I'm talking cock. Okay, and talking cock is getting together, drinking tons of alcohol, eating lots of food, and just blowing out the government and everything else that is in your life, you know, in, in, in ways that is not often appropriate, like, for example, in the newspaper, for sure, or even in everyday discourse, okay? And I actually see the kind of rock and roll stuff that we play, and, and when I go and play at the hood uh, with this band, as a kind of large form of talking cock. <laughs> uh, because when I, well, I've played here in town at this place, it's, it is like sitting around in the hawker stall and drinking lots of beer around the hawker table and talking cock, taking over a complete club and doing it because it's mostly men, and it's a lot of alcohol, 
and it's rock and roll kind of, you know, stuff that uh, anti-L culture tried to, to push off to the side. It's just been a heck of a lot of fun, and that's my approach to cultural studies. Thank you. Sorry, I went so far.